Where do you think your meat comes from? I always imagine a cow just, you know, grazing on a field somewhere. Our meat comes from the grocery store that we eat and um, I guess like dairy farms, cattle farms, um, chicken houses. Grassy farmland with fences and cowboys gently railing them around. I picture the pig living in a pen, um, hopefully uh, on grass and somewhere they can roll around and uh, just a you know, nice, healthy environment. I try not to think about it too much. The cages where they lay their eggs, I'm thinking they're a little closer quarters, but I'm assuming then that they get let out to run around in the fields to play. I mean, there's cows, but you also have steers, right? So, you know, it's just like the Old West or something. I don't think the typical American has the uh, slightest idea where their meat comes from or how it's produced. This is the first time that a serious group of uh, a cross-section of people have looked at how we produce food and what it does to public health, the environment, the impact on rural communities, and how the animals themselves fare. Mr. Purdue, I bet your chickens would enjoy corn dogs. I think because of advertising of companies like uh, Purdue, where the, the chickens are all happy and healthy, and email the, the owner of the company and the happy cows from California that produce cheese, I think that's the image people have. They have the myth of the family farmer. Milk comes from happy cows. Up until about 1960, the farmer raised several different crops and they raised some cattle, they raised some pigs, and they raised some chickens. The farmers were known by the community. The product they made was usually marketed locally. That production model's changed dramatically over the last 50 years. Over 90% of the meat that you would buy in a grocery store in this country is meat that has come from what were called confined animal feeding operations or factory farms. Those are animals that have been raised and have lived a very short life in very intensive population conditions. It's the only way we can produce as much meat as we're consuming. We're consuming meat ourselves in ways that require us to raise animals for meat in totally inhumane conditions. In the 50s and 60s, you'd see farmers with a lot of little uh, triangle sheds made out of wood that a sow and her piglets would live in. They would go in and out of that. There would be a feed trough outside of it. Now, the pig can be uh, confined in a gestation crate where it has uh, about a foot to move forward or backwards and a foot to move side to side from uh, about a week before it's inseminated until the piglets are delivered. Then it's moved into a slightly larger crate, the uh, farrowing crate. The boards are separated out and the sows are, are kept to either go into the reproductive chain or to be sold for food. Usually a swine industrial facility will have maybe five to 10 buildings in a cluster with anywhere from five to 20,000 hogs in each building. The pigs stand on a metal slatted floor for all their lives. They move from that production facility via a truck several hundred if not thousands of miles to be slaughtered. The new model is very sterile and in a lot of ways very cold. Industrial is a very good word for it. It's very much detached from all the husbandry that people normally think of. A good farmer was known for his husbandry. The farmer was much more interactive in the lives of the animals they were raising. Um, there was more natural setting, more uh, grazing on grass. Hogs would root out in the field naturally. Hey, Stella. This is Stella. She's our first factory farm sow. She was a breeding sow in a factory farm, and we think that she fell from a truck on her way to slaughter. There's nowhere for these animals to go. 
Most of these animals have stories of abuse um, or neglect, starvation, things like that. You know, I, I mean, this is a, a calling. I didn't ask for it. I didn't want to have a sanctuary, but there is a need, and there's a great need. Bella! Come on, Bella! Come on, Bella! Good girl! Our first date was at a fundraiser. Uh, Bo Diddley was in concert at one of our friends farms and so we went there and they were cooking on the grill they were cooking their hamburgers and hot dogs and they had veggie burgers because they knew there would be vegetarians there and so Dale uh, ate a couple of burgers and I had my veggie burger and that was our first date and uh, we just clicked. Elaine was looking for a soulmate a, a, a Christian guy that would spend the rest of her life with we headed off the first date. I knew she had a sanctuary, but Elaine's a very intelligent lady, and she wouldn't let me actually see the sanctuary until after about our fifth or sixth date. When he was hooked, <laughs> when there was no turning back. <laughs> I grew up in the Baptist church. Um, I have always been active in the church. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is God in the flesh. I don't think you could get any more conservative in your Christian beliefs than my Christian beliefs. This is part of my life. This is the most important part of my life, my faith. All of my relatives on my mom's side were farmers. My aunt had chickens and pigs and horses and cows. And uh, I just loved being around the farm. My brothers would bring home pigs and we would raise them and we would eat them. I was always taught that that's what God gave us the animals for. I actually have been rescuing pigs for about seven years and still eating meat. And I would joke, you know, don't let my pigs know what I'm eating. You know, we don't tell them what we're eating. Because if farm pigs were to eat, my pet pigs were my pets. Those were not to eat. Someone sent me a video and asked me to look at it. And it was of a factory farm. And I had never seen that before. I could not have in my wildest dreams imagined that anyone could have created such a cruel system as factory farming and the things that they were doing to those animals. And when you read about it or you hear about it, it's different. When you see that kind of abuse and that kind of a system, um, <laughs> it's so horrible and I, it's, it's very emotional. And when I saw that, I was so ashamed that, especially as a Christian, that I was supporting that, that I didn't know about it. And here I was supporting that kind of horrific abuse and cruelty. No animal, no animal should be subjected to the kind of inhumane treatment that those animals endure every day. They live lives of total, total misery. And it, it is a shame, it's an abomination when I tried to tell my family about this factory farming business, my dad would say, a farmer wouldn't be cruel to his animals. He makes money off those animals. He's gonna take care of those animals. Well, logically, yeah. But when you have a huge production facility like that and your goal is to make money, those animals are just commodities. They're not even animals, they're just a thing. They're a production unit. I think the typical farmer, uh, contract producer with, with one of the large companies would say, the pigs are safe, the pigs are well fed, uh, the pigs are producing. But you walk into one of these barns and they're squealing, they're gnawing at the bars, they're, they'll, they'll charge the front of the cage when people walk by. They exhibit very aggressive behavior. We had a couple of commissioners uh, brought to tears by looking at the, at the swine confinement crates. You have a trajectory throughout the whole biblical tradition of uh, God caring for the animals, God caring for the, the creation, and um, humans being mandated to uh, work with God and caring about creation. It's the first mandate in the Bible. 
Uh, be fruitful, multiply, which is the one mandate we're good at. Second one is, is, and it's really part of the first one, be fruitful, multiply, in order that you can have dominion over the earth and over uh, the animal kingdom. And the dominion does not mean dominate. Uh, it's, it's rather more of a concept of stewardship. We're to, we are to reflect God's character uh, to the earth and to the animal kingdom. The character he reflects towards us, we're now to administrate uh, on, on the earth. Uh, I think we've gotten so sanitized from being disconnected from looking at what happens before we eat that we have a very little consciousness about that. What was being done with this animal? Was it in a factory farm? Was it being uh, just brought up in such a disgusting way that had we seen that, we would not even eat the animal? A broiler is uh, the type of chicken that you eat. A fryer sometimes, it's, it's the one that you consume as opposed to a laying hen. We took uh, the commissioners out to a chicken uh, facility, and there were six barns that were probably uh, about as long as a football field, uh, with about 30,000 chickens in each barn. I looked around when the lights came up, and, and most of them did not have very many feathers. And I said to one of the workers, is this a sick barn? Not knowing if they segregate them if they're sick or not. And they said, no, this, this is pretty normal. It was an oppressive atmosphere, uh, choked with dust and the smell of ammonia because they stand in their own litter. Two commissioners were overcome by ammonia and, and the smell and the oppressive nature of the atmosphere in the barn, and I had to help them out. And I stood outside with them while they, you know, while they kind of got their breath. They're bred to put most of their metabolic energy into building large breasts because that's what Americans want is breast meat. And so their bone structure is so weak that when they hit a certain weight at 47 to 48 days, they have to be removed and slaughtered or they'll start breaking their legs and their hips and then they can't be slaughtered because they're damaged birds. They're caught by hand, and they'll take eight chickens by their legs and, and throw them in the cages for transport. They're grabbed by their legs and hung upside down on hooks. An electric charge goes through their head to uh, try to render them senseless. The industry says there's three to four percent that are not rendered uh, senseless before their head's cut off. Then they end up wrapped in cellophane on the grocery store shelf. This is the way the meat that you see in a grocery store that you consume in restaurants is produced in this country. Today, Christians define dominion as saying the animals are created for us to eat. When in reality, we've been given a huge responsibility to care for the animals. There are a number of stories of Jesus' compassion extending to other animals, and those stories are traced through saints throughout the history of Christianity, so it's very much a part of the tradition to extend the scope of morality and to extend the scope of compassion to other animals. If nothing else, that story of Jesus and the mule and the person who, is, who said he owned the mule and was beating him. When Jesus says the Creator hears the cries of the mule, then we have to assume that if one believes in the Creator who's central to the Christian tradition, that the Creator would hear the cries of the animals in these factory farms. To me, the issue isn't rights. What rights do they have? Uh, it's an issue of mercy. Like, we have power over them, and how do we use that power? And we can use the power to our own benefit, uh, or we can use the power, at least to some degree, to their benefit, and that's about having mercy. And in some way, God is merciful to us. He could crush us. He could do anything he wants, but he's merciful to us. He's good to us. We're to extend that character to the animal kingdom. Jesus will provide love and salvation for us all. Love and salvation one and all. Yeah, lay my burden down and I'll come. It's called Christian Honky Tonk, in case you were wondering about that genre. Uh, I said last service, what it needs is more cowbell, though. You need a cowbell in that song. It's the, the 
uh, passage that we're looking at centers on uh, worrying and how to be free of worrying. And Jesus calls our attention to the birds, the ravens specifically. And he says, look at the ravens. Live like the ravens. Live as carefree as the ravens because they don't toil or spin, and yet God feeds them. And just notice that phrase, God feeds them. It's a theme that you find throughout the Bible that God loves animals. God loves animals. You may not have uh, noticed this before, but some of the covenants in the Bible involve animals. Uh, they're included in the covenant. God makes covenants with animals. It shows you something about his high regard for them. For example, in Hosea 2, God makes a covenant with human beings, but also with the birds of the air and the livestock and every creature on the ground. And the covenant is that he's gonna, uh, there'll be a day that will come when there'll be no more war, no more violence, and there'll be peace on this earth. But, but God includes them in, in covenants. He loves animals. One of the reasons he gives for not destroying Nineveh in uh, Jonah chapter 4 is that there's so many animals that live there. And in fact, the first mandate ever given to human beings was to have loving dominion over the earth and over the animals. And I've always believed, still believe, that one of the surest benchmarks for how we're doing as a species in terms of our relationship with God concerns how we're treating animals. And on that benchmark, we're not doing so hot, folks. From the text that we see, God extends that compassion to other than humans, to other animals, and Christianity must think about extending that compassion to other animals as well. One cannot be just passively complicit in a system where so much torture and so much pain is necessarily part of that system. In the cage facility, it was very much automated. You know, five or six birds in a metal cage standing for their whole lives, and it's about the size of a file cabinet drawer. They couldn't open their wings without uh, making it difficult for everybody else in the cage. Their beaks are trimmed so they don't injure one another. They all face out the same way so they can receive their food in a trough. The excrement and, and eggs go out the back and onto a conveyor belt and move down. The male chicks are usually just disposed of. They're not even raised. And so the male chicks are just in a dumpster till they suffocate and die. I was raised on meat, and I, I'm a steak lover, rare. I go to the restaurants, they said, how would you like it? I said, as rare as you can serve it. And I just loved it, bloody meat, mm. But there's, I, 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 as I grew, I began to feel worse and worse and worse about that until about five years ago. I finally decided it's time to buck up. And the main thing that drove me was a conviction. I really felt God telling me that I am to have a respect for all life. And the way I reflect that, one of the ways I reflect that is by uh, not participating in any violence uh, for convenience. And I found that when I made that decision, it really opened up a door of perception for me where I began to see the world in a more beautiful way because uh, it was no longer using everything for utilitarian purposes. But I think uh, people need to uh, really find out for themselves what's going on and get to the point of being disgusted enough so that they actually change. It takes a lot of willpower to say, I'm not going to benefit from animal violence. Uh, and to get that willpower, you've got to see the grotesqueness of the animal violence. <laughs> The examples of mistreatment of animals like uh, dragging down cattle into the slaughter facility or moving them in with a front end loader, it's a symptom of the industrial model. There's a separation of the farmer from close, intimate understanding contact of, of the animal and, and you're treating it more like a commodity, more like a production unit instead of a living animal. That is what is at the heart of the industrial system as far as animal welfare is concerned. It's, it's okay to jam them in a cage if they can't move because they're just a production unit that's gonna be eaten. It's gotta produce more production units. Cattle are ruminant animals. They were given four stomachs for a reason. And when they're fed grain uh, in their finishing process in, in a feedlot, gives it diseased liver uh, problems. So they get liver abscesses, so they have to be treated by antibiotics.
probably the dairy industry is, is as harmful um, and as painful for the animals that are part of that industry as the meat producing industries. The dairy cows are not only injected with hormones to keep their udders so large that they can continue to produce milk beyond any natural amount of milk that they would produce, but they've got to be pregnant all the time. As soon as they have a calf, that's what feeds the veal industry. A calf born to a dairy cow will sometimes not even nurse from that dairy cow, will immediately be taken away and be fed in a confined system, in a, in a cage. So the dairy industry feeds the veal industry. When you look at this entire system of mass production of meat in the United States now, it's obviously a system of oppression. It's a system that has some people in power and all animals with no power at all who are living miserable lives. And with the kind of call to justice that is at the heart of Christianity, is central to what Christianity has always interjected into a culture, which is the oppressed are the ones for whom God must speak. I think for, uh, for many of us, the, the whole issue of the care of animals seems so mammoth that we almost don't know where to start. All we have to do is start with one step. If you're a huge beef eater, maybe you could start to cut down a little bit. You can help the animals by supporting local farmers who are trying to do the right thing by raising grass-fed cows, non-caged eggs. That's a start down the path towards being responsible as a citizen, being conscientious as a shopper, and being compassionate as a Christian. We're standing in the middle of a 300 acre pasture uh, with lush, lush forage. All of this is very nutritious to the animals. This is the best environment we feel to let an animal, especially a ruminant animal, an animal that only needs grass for feed, only eats forage. They actually get to harvest their own feed and then they get to digest it and build strong bodies and baby calves. We like to see them have every opportunity to live to the fullness of their created capacity. I mean, if these animals are going to be grown for our consumption, we have the responsibility to require that they get the best life possible. And I believe that um, we have the responsibility as animal stewards to make sure that that's available to them. You're nothing but two days old. Yes, you are once a week at home for a meal. And then when they gather as communities, Christians can have a compassionate meal that is marked by more vegetarian fare than meat. So decrease the amount of meat that's part of that meal. Making sure that you know where that meat has come from, how that animal lived before the animal became meat. The more and more I became educated on the cruelties of factory farming, and what we're doing in America and across the, the earth with our sad American diet and what it, it entails. You know, today Christians consume what tastes good to them, just like the average American. As a Christian, we should reach out to other Christians. And so I share with them the negative aspects of pet factory farming and the positive aspects of plant-based diet. And if you can help a few people that'll cross over, then they start doing the same thing and it starts spreading. And you start, you begin to get a dialogue. Every day in our lives we make choices. And a simple thing by deciding what to eat every day can alleviate so much suffering. Now for me as a Christian especially, the choice is simple. If we can, if it's in our power to do it, why don't we do the right thing and choose to alleviate suffering?